Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear participants in the Blue Innovation Dog, it gives me a great pleasure to address you today on the behalf of the European Maritime Safety Agency, EMSA. EMSA is the EU's decentralized agency based in Lisbon. Our mandate from when we were established 20 years ago is to support the European Commission and the Member States in a variety of maritime safety, security and sustainability related areas, all of which are linked to the specific European legislative instruments that do not include smaller recreational craft at the moment. That is why the boating sector and EMSA have not traditionally intersected. Nevertheless, we are all working towards the same bold, ambitious and far-reaching goal and I'm convinced that there are synergies that can be explored. Innovation, technology, knowledge, these are all essential components of the safe and sustainable transition, which is a priority for all aspects of our economies and societies. A goal of the climate neutrality for Europe by 2050, with 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, is an interim objective. This is the aim of the European Green Deal. And the pillar of our work in EMSA is to help deliver its maritime dimension. This work is by nature collaborative, because in maritime, as in every other sector, the sustainable transition should be a joint effort, one in which every stakeholder has a part to play. The true maritime decarbonization that will allow us to meet our climate goal naturally requires the involvement of the boating sector, which comprises of at least 6 million recreational crafts sailing in EU waters and over 10,000 inland and coastal marinas. It is a thriving and growing sector, both in terms of the number of the vessels as well as of their sizes. The health benefits of the water sports and the growing interest in the marine tourism and the leisure activities, coupled with the increasing disposable income, are supporting the demand for recreational boating. Your sector has seen significant growth in recent years and will see more in the future. The global recreational boating market is projected to grow by more than 5% between 2021 and 2027. Your sector supports over a quarter of million jobs in the EU and contributes strongly to tourism and to local economies in coastal and island regions. It is an important part of the EU economy. Moreover, the future evolution and prosperity of the boating sector is dependent on the clean environment and biodiversity. Therefore, I believe it is in the best interest of the industry to contribute to maritime decarbonization. I am further convinced that decarbonization is a great opportunity for the sector. By embracing and harnessing new technologies, boating can become not only more sustainable and respectful of the environment in which it operates, but also more economically viable and safe. At EMSA, we are currently deeply involved in supporting the European Commission in the Fit for 55 package of measures, which should result in overall greenhouse gas reduction, the uptake of alternative sustainable fuels, and the use of electricity at birth. Although these initiatives and other like them are mostly directed at large-scale commercial vessels, they can also be leveraged by the boating industry. Alternative fuels for maritime is one example. In October, to support the Commission, policymakers and the industry, we released two important studies, one of biofuels and one of ammonia. These studies looked at both alternatives across several indicators, including availability, sustainability, cost implications, and crucially, safety. They are publicly available on our website and I invite you to refer to it and consider them. Future studies will center on hydrogen, wind-assisted propulsion and further ahead on waste heat recovery systems. 
Of course, it goes without saying that boating sector can and should benefit from the development and deployment of alternative fuels. Biofuels, for example, could be a ready-to-use alternative for shipping and boating alike. Onshore power supply is another area that is in our focus and one that could also be of the interest to the boating sector. The Fuel EU Maritime Initiative and the new regulation on alternative fuels infrastructure will require container and passenger vessels to use the OPS or another zero emission technology in ports as of 2030. As a result, we in EMSA worked on the guidance in support of the development of short side electricity and OPS solutions in ports. This was published in June last year and focuses on the key steps needed to introduce safe, cost-effective and future-proof OPS. At the same time, we are working on the guidance on the safety of battery energy storage systems on board, which we know is also an important issue for the boating industry. The green transition will not happen overnight. It is a process which has a strong safety dimension. Put simply, there is no maritime sustainability without safety. For EMSA, safety is in our DNA. We know that the innovative new technologies, which are being trialed, implemented, or are yet to be developed across the sector to reduce shipping-related emissions, all have an essential associated safety dimension. Safety is a common denominator for all those operating in the maritime domain, from large commercial vessels and cruise ships to yachts and boats. Constant effort to enhance safety are essential in the technical dimension, the operational aspects, and the human element. Proficiency and skills make a life-saving difference not only in the professional seafarers world, but also and even more so in the recreational craft sector. To conclude, I believe there are areas in which there is a mutual interest, and we are open and ready to engage in dialogue idea sharing and exchange of information and best practices with your sector. Today's event is an opportunity to learn how the boating industry can join forces with other maritime stakeholders to further develop and implement innovative solutions in the context of green transition, focusing on the use of alternative fuels and powering solutions for ships and ports. Now, let me wish you all a very successful and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so very quickly, may I introduce Carla Di Maria from San Lorenzo Group. How are you? Ciao, Martin. Nice to see you. The same for me. Anthony, please. Yep. <laughs> Princess, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Princess Anthony. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was the last one Marco, to arrive. Marco, nice to see you. Nice to see you. I'll stay in the middle. Right? Nice, to meet you. Nice, to meet you. nice to meet you. You sit where you like. Uh, stay in the middle. I am you stay in the middle. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Very simple first question. Is this the first time you've been on stage together? Yes. Uh, it is, pretty much. All of you together. Yes, together, yes. Try the mixes. As a group. Yeah. Let's say, let's say that group. some of us work together, but not anymore. Ex exactly. exactly. <laughs> Are you boss, even your boss? <laughs> So, should we do this in Italian or in English? I mean, we could be quite comfortable with the first one, but... My English is not so good. <laughs> no, that was fine. Listen, it's a pleasure to have you here. I want to just quickly introduce the fact that you are probably the foremost powerful people in yachting today. Is that fair? They are. <laughs> they are. No, I'm, I'm going I'm to just literally throw a few things into the mix, first of all. If I ask you today... Can we just start, and we'll work through to Marco. How many boats per year are you delivering as Benito Group? Globally, we are roughly 10,000 units per year. 10,000 units a year? Carlo One, de Maria? 100. Azzi? About 250. Marco? 260. Okay. So you represent... 265, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> as a group. He's not giving, he's not giving all the figures. He's not giving so, so, all the figures. So, so literally, you are the powerhouses of yachting today. You're delivering more boats than anyone else. I have a trick question. What percentage is green or zero-focused? 
Am I always the first one to answer? Always, or? always. Uh, there sorry. is a wife in here. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> you have, you have, the, whole, you have the, the whole seat. He's the smart guy in the room, you see? <laughs> All right. He knew the plan, he knew the plan. Ma um, Marcello told me. <laughs> now, let's say that sustainability, at least for us, we, 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 we talk about it already a bit, yeah. but uh, uh, we, we approach, at least from a um, composite standpoint, so polyester and uh, other components, uh, pretty seriously because uh, it is a big chunk of what we do. And uh, uh, as of today, we already produce uh, almost 20% of all the composite parts are biosourced. So there is a component of that. And, uh, uh, and we keep on improving that in terms of percentage of integration of uh, alternative biosource raising that can have an impact uh, over uh, and in the future years. Uh, we also introduced the first uh, boat, it's over there, the picture, and it's on the stand uh, of Benito that you know very well. Uh, um, uh, with the, the first fully uh, designed and conceived boat in uh, resin helium, which is a 100% recyclable resin, which uh, I think it brings uh, another step forward. Uh, and uh, uh, as you were saying before, we are not probably presenting the entire marine business, but surely we have a, a weight that is allowing us to invest and to try to test uh, technologies and to be a bit of ahead of the market and push this change. And on the same side, I think that uh, we are testing in each of our segments, uh, so day boating, uh, real estate, uh, on the water, and uh, sailboats, monohull and multi-hull, alternative uh, propulsion system and units. So this is a, a bit the commitment that we have, uh, and we, we try to change the culture from having to, from willing to. And that's uh, what we f believe it's the global change that it's uh, onboarding, I think, all the people in this uh, floor because it's uh, where we can change and bring uh, the next uh, level up of the green into the marine business. Okay, so Jane Guido, what percentage today would you say is really green focused production? 20% in the composite parts, that's for sure. It's, it's fact. Yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, the propulsion units. Uh, as, as you know, we are still integrator into that. And uh, so the, the take rate depends on how fast we are in order to convince our customer. i just make you a very simple example because probably it's, uh, I don't want to take the whole floor. You take Delphia, which is our uh, electric solution that we just introduced on the river boats, and already 30% of that uh, has been sold and bought by customers, not by dealers, in uh, a fully electrical solution. The problem, it's more that we encounter today, and that's probably a part of the discussion, an infrastructure issue. Yeah. But th there are people that are willing to be uh, there with us and not just us to push it. Yeah. So it's coming bo bottom up. Carla. Yes. Well, for San Lorenzo and uh, on uh, Monday next, we will have here our sustainability conference. It will be a conference just on sustainability. Um, is a is a part that we decided to do together with Giant in the energy because uh, our sector, even if there is a misperception that we are polluting enormously, we are just peanuts compared in the, to, the shipping, to the shipping whole uh, sector. But we decided to go with Siemens, with MTU, with Volvo, in order to work with them, because it's true also, I think, I don't know, it will be 20 or 25 uh, percentage in the composite, but actually the true pollution is the engine. So uh, it's not something that happened over all, uh, overnight. And uh, we, we started and we have a part being public. We also declare this in our non-financial declaration. So uh, it's something with big investment, but uh, a true uh, convention. We are working now. And in 2024, we'll be on the market. The first uh, uh, super yacht, San Lorenzo with uh, the hotellerie on board done through fuel cell. So f hydrogen is uh, methanol transformed with water in hydrogen. This is the first step Then we will go through, of course, just for the hotellerie. We cannot say that methanol today is the for, for the propulsion, but will come. Will come because uh, progressively we will work with them in order to do this. In this moment, in uh, Erlanden, if I pronounce this well, here in Germany. Siemens is, uh, has already completed uh, the test bench of the module of the transformer in fuel cell. So this for us is a reality. And we signed the agreement with them uh, two years ago. So this uh, will be 
as I said, progressively Im implemented at the point that uh, we will go then from the hotellerie to a short, low-speed uh, navigation till the 2027, where, thanks to them also, because we, this is something that no one, even the big uh, group like Beneteau or Azimut, can afford alone. So we are working on them. This is, a, uh, is a, actually a great result because uh, it comes. It's not zero emission, because for zero emission, you need uh, hydrogen, very difficult to manage and difficult to, to find, and, uh, or electric uh, bat batteries. But the batteries, today already there are the fuel electric, but are very small boat. So we don't think so much at the zero emission today in navigation. At Anchor, yes, we are implementing this is a using a lithium battery and, but this lasts six, eight hours of hotelery, not, not uh, propulsion. We think, and this is the project with, uh, with uh, Siemens, to uh, what is called carbon neutrality. That means that uh, you don't add the carbon, CO2, in the air, because the process to transform water and the methanol into hydrogen kept some air on the on the air, and is exactly the same uh, CO2 that you produce. So that is neutral because we produce a bit, but we take it from the air. So this is called the carbon neutrality. This allows one day to go to the propulsion, the, the green propulsion, but it's a long path. Yeah. Anthony. So the very precise question to your, uh, answer to your question is none of them and all of them. Um, there, there is no such thing as a zero emissions boat, and there is likely not to be for a very long time. Uh, or, or ever, in fact. Well, don't know. Water, water is viscous, is, and that's the problem. Um, but we are focusing um, on trying to avoid um, marketing statements and trying to do things that actually, on every boat, have elements that uh, make the boat more sustainable. Um, we do offer a hybrid boat, not much interest. Um, we are delivering boats now with, um, with 180 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery packs for hotel services, um, which provided that they are charged, um, uh, charged uh, on shore as opposed to running the engines to charge them um, are, quite, uh, are quite sustainable. But mostly we're trying to focus on the conception of our boat and trying to make them more efficient. Um, if you look at our, um, at, our, at our fleet of boats that we have here at Dusseldorf, this year, um, compared to the boats that we had well, the first time I was here in 2016, um, they look the same, more modern, more beautiful, but it, they look similar boats, but each and every one of them has 10 to 30% less resistance through the water than the boats we had uh, before. So we haven't done anything on the powertrain side because as people have said, that's out of our ability to have huge influence on that, but we can do the, the right job to make sure that the boats in the way that they operate are more efficient. And that is through the hydrodynamic design, through the materials we use for the boats. And interestingly, one of the things that we're starting to think about is there's a lot of pressure on the PR to launch a green boat. This is hybrid. Look, there's a battery. It can go for a couple of hours or an hour electrically, which does absolutely nothing. And yet that's one boat. Maybe somebody buys, two people buy it, that's two boats. But we have made 20,000 boats in our lifetime, and when you add our, our friends here, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of boats, most of which were made with no, with no, not even a tip of the hat to sustainability, and maybe there's something we can do to take 1% of the emissions off the existing fleet that's out there and have an impact that's far greater than developing a single electric boat. And we're looking at that as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Nancy. Marco, finally. Uh, I would like to link to what uh, just Anthony said, that as a matter of fact, we talked about fats. For sure, everybody has the uh, same focus. For sure, everybody wants to get the right, uh, let's say, zero emission dream. At the end of the day, what has been done so far and what has been delivered so far. So we as an azimut, we have been invested a lot uh, to develop uh, 
uh, kill in a way that should be much more efficient. Uh, we have the much larger extensive production with the carbon fire superstructure. Uh, this allows us to keep the, the, the weight down and to reduce uh, uh, the power that you need uh, in order to have uh, the much more efficient boat uh, and we can uh, test ourselves, uh, try to have uh, less consumption compared to what has been, uh, let's say, previous generation boats. So I also, it's, uh, I like to push uh, the, the sector to try to create a kind of a common index, like it's working, working on, the, on the automotive sector. So at least everybody talks uh, efficiency, not efficient. There should be some parameter that should, be, should work for everybody at the same level. And this is something that I push and uh, trying to, to get uh, in, a, in a common view. Otherwise, it's just a marketing uh, talks. We have been launching uh, hybrid. We, we, we're done with Ambrosia. Uh, 2006, uh, we did the Magellano 50 in 2010. The first hybrid was working, not working. It was just enough to get out of the arbor and back the seat. Not even back, actually. Now we launched the, the, the invented uh, Beyond, that is a uh, uh, collaboration with the Siemens that was a nice system in a, in a hybrid uh, version, but again, what we try to do is now what is possible to prove in terms of efficiency and something that can be proved with the actual boat that is sailing. As Anthony said, you have a lot of boats are sailing in our seas. Okay. You can add whatever you like. This is a discussion. Okay. She's too fast. Um. Can I introduce the panel? You shouldn't know uh, them, but you can know them. Marco Valli, the chief executive of Asimov Brunetti Group. Anthony from Princess Yachts. Carlo Di Maria, Princess Yachts. Carlo Di Maria from San Lorenzo Group. And Gian Guido Girotti. Giotto Girotti. from Benetton oh, Group. God. Is that okay? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, like, Carlo. I don't know. I would like something. It's interesting that we opened this morning the, the session. You say we are here, no PR. No bluff, and you are right, because the perception is that on, in the yachting sector there is a lot of bluff and marketing. I tell you this because being a public company, sometimes, I must say often, the investor asks, why we are here everything about sustainability in your sector? One is saying, it happens that uh, in 2024 will be a super yacht full electric means that needs all the volume and even more to be put with, uh, with, uh, with batteries, simply impossible. Someone said that methanol is not the answer. And it's not true. Methanol is the answer. A uh, few days ago, um, there was a news on the newspaper that Porsche and Siemens, and we heard here even uh, before the, the news, they open uh, in Patagonia a big, big plant to transform methanol into uh, a synthetic fuel that is called uh, uh, MTG, methanol to gasoline. This is true. Merckx today is investing enormous amount of money for having the, the shipping line in uh, fuel with methanol. I, I repeat, it will not happen overnight. But in any case, on December 15, there has been the HIMO, uh, HIMO is International Maritime Organization uh, meeting. They have two per year. And they decided to anticipate, because they are accelerating the process, and this is even a good thing, even if it put us all in trouble. Uh, but uh, they have anticipated the zero emission in uh, shipping from 2000. Uh, 100 to 2050, 50 years anticipation. So we cannot just say that we are doing to do whatever is possible because it's something that has to happen. And that's why I think it's good, Mar Marco, what you say. We can even join, join uh, forces, but it's something that there is no option. And uh, therefore, I think that uh, uh, we, are, we really hear everything, but uh, the true thing is that the, the, the way are there, as of Porsche and uh, even 
MEGs are offering. The problem is that it's very heavy in terms of resources to be put, both financial and human resources, but this is the only way. There is no option. And in June, because they, they meet twice a year, HIMO, in June, they will meet again to decide in details the progression. So it cannot happen today from, so there will be a progression. So it's a serious matter. Yeah, 100%. Jamie, you had another comment. Now, the, the, I wanted to take back on the point of Mark. I think that w what you saw in the panel is that uh, <clears throat> there is not a single answer because, first of all, there is not a single rule. No. Uh, w when you think about sustainability, you have to think and you have to split about the process before the construction of the parts. What we do, which we build boats, and what Carla was explaining was the usage, and then uh, it's the recyclable process. So we have already, already to start between ourselves to decide uh, what are the KPIs that are really measurable and make sense, uh, and uh, uh, how we can align on that? Because I think that if you go to the extreme of the extreme of the taxonomy, uh, the green taxonomy, I mean, we will come to a point where we will be here in a boat of Dusseldorf, uh, and uh, uh, people will be financed or not uh, yes. based uh, on the level of compliance of the company. So if we don't uh, sit together understand what is the level of uh, technical competence, because what Carla was saying about uh, we cannot do that, it's true, because we cannot have the power of the automotive business. We were talking about 12,000 boats uh, all together, okay? 12,000 boats is probably one model of an average car sold in the world. <laughs> yes. I know, yeah, Anthony is a much more expert than... Yep. Uh, for, if you're Bentley or a Ferrari, if, yeah, most of them are a few hundred thousand. <laughs> so you understand that we talk about uh, numbers that are uh, peanuts for the level of complexity that we treat in terms of the subject. So at the same time, I think that we need to understand uh, through European rules to start with, uh, because already going on the other side of the Atlantic, it's not easy. Yeah. But uh, and to sit together and trying to find between uh, politics and uh, uh, boat builders uh, already, uh, uh, what are the KPIs that we are working, you're working, you're working, you're working, and trying to match them? Because otherwise, we will end up with uh, 50 solutions, but none of them is going to become uh, the transforming one. Agreed. Both of you put your hands up. Uh, Anthony, go, go first, and then Mark will finish. Sure, and, and I think you, you start to bring up a really good point. Um, this is an industry, we are the amongst the largest players in the industry. If Alberto was sitting here, we'd pretty much have all five. Um, but each of, each of one of us is a very small company, some larger, some smaller, but all generally small. Yeah. Um, we also do not have, the, the emissions are largely generated by, by the powertrain, not to downplay materials, but it is very much of a powertrain problem. But none of us have any capability internally to design our own powertrains. Um, we talk about alternative fuels, but that becomes an infrastructural problem, and none of us represent governments everywhere. When people say, well, we can get a yacht to, to run on, 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 on hydrogen or on, on biofuels, that's fantastic, but our yachts go to the places that have the least infrastructure in the world. So when they're in Tahiti, Fiji, and the Greek islands, that might work. So what we need to do, this really is, um, I'm a big believer in small companies being innovative and coming up with ideas. But this is an industry that really needs a coordinated approach globally with people who worry about the infrastructure, convergence to a single solution, because if, if, if San Lorenzo comes up with its own system for one biofuel and we come up with another one and everybody's doing alternative fuels but they're different, you're never going to have the infrastructure to provide it. And there's a real need, I think, to harness government to start to organize this and said, let's figure out where we want to be as an industry in 2050 who's going to be developing the technologies from the from propulsion side to get us there, and then how we can bring the boat builders along uh, to, to, to support that. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Marco, I've got another uh, question yeah, for you. I have to say <laughs> that Anthony said the right thing, so the fact that um, we are depending on the engines. Engines are coming from the truck uh, automotive yeah. uh, generation, not really coming from marine. So we have to follow what some, somebody else decides on the bigger uh, scenario and uh, everybody try to, to identify the right route but at the end of the day uh, alternative fuels uh, and infrastructure will be 
one of the solutions, everybody will converse over there. We did, uh, inside Azimut uh, a year ago, we did our uh, life cycle assessment. So we took one boat, a new one, and we realized what was the mission from the zero, so from the, basically from when you start up to the moment where the boat is finished, and we realized that 80% uh, of the, let's say, of the mission is coming from the use of the boat. This is the reason why we try to attack what we can do. But what we can do is to buy engines and try to do in a way that should be the much more efficient and try to uh, reduce, uh, reduce the, the mission through the consumption. This is something that uh, each kind of, let's say, small companies <laughs> like we are. I, I think, I think uh, what's interesting. I would say that we need, uh, because we are real peanuts and we need the big uh, player to do this for us. Automotive first, of course, because we have seen uh, uh, every, you, you, maybe you remember that during the mess there has been a, a protest against uh, Yachting. It's nothing, because during the pandemic, after two months, we were, uh, it was forbidden to use uh, the cars and the, the hair immediately improved. So everybody knows that there is a misperception of how we can impact on that. And be sure that they are obliged to do this before us. The fact that Max uh, now is uh, the Max line, shipping line, they are investing so much. Even the automotive Porsche is a good news that comes a few days ago. We have to do this with them. They will solve the problem before us. The engine manufacturer uh, for, uh, for marine uh, yachting, they are uh, already working on this. Because if they decide to anticipate from 2050, even more, because 50 years in one decision is a lot. So we must be careful and fully involved in doing this with someone who really can help. I think what's, what's fascinating, sorry, one second, it's, it's so important, and we've all talked about it, there's a collaboration process. Yeah. There needs to be a complete triangular partnership, regulator or policymaker, manufacturers and supply chain, and infrastructure. At the moment, it's disjointed. And I feel this is one of the things where Felix from um, <laughs> the, the European Commission or um, at Philip from the EBI should bring everyone together. Yeah. And I want to understand what you four need from someone like Felix at uh, DG Maritime in Brussels. What, what do you need from the policymakers to change your businesses or to improve the process or to make it easier or smarter? Because to me, that's one of the factors. Infrastructure is another topic we can bring into, but how can Europe or Brussels help you accelerate change or improve your future? Can I answer with a question? You can. <laughs> that because, for example, Marco said that they made an assessment of the life cycle and they calculated an impact of X percentage of uh, where the, the impact is. Still, these are KPIs where you decide the, the, the elements that you put in. So uh, I don't want to say that each of us can cheat on them, <laughs> but uh, somehow, yes. And we have... Uh, it's I mean, not, it's not, not cheating, it, it's, it's managing. Not, it's, 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 an interpretation, it's an interpretation of numbers yeah. Yeah. that are uh, absolutely not structured by a, an European agreement. So you can say that uh, the life of, a, of our boat, whatever that is, it's uh, 30, 30 days uh, or it's uh, 150 days, uh, and your impact uh, over the CO2 emission, it's completely different, okay? So... Uh, we could say that uh, our charter business is probably the best one uh, because uh, we, 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 we don't pollute as builder, but at the same time, they use the boats 150 days. But uh, so I think that the first and most important thing is to decide uh, how do we manage those KPIs and what are the KPIs based on uh, the type of boats that we have. Because and, who, and who dictates the t these KPIs? Is it the manufacturer or Europe or both but of you, you together? You take, you take the non. Uh, uh, how, how, uh, uh, the, 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 all the reports that we do on the stock market, yeah. you make your own assessment. Okay? Yeah. So by the time you want to adjust. Standard, uh, actually. By the uh, time you want to adjust that, uh, you can say that 80% uh, of your problem is out of the door of your company. It's still a problem, but it's out of the door of your company. So I think that 
the point that we have to make sure is that probably that's why I was saying we have to onboard anyway Brunswick, which is a big corporation of small boats and so forth, because we have type of usage that needs to be addressed uh, to understand the full life cycle. And the full life cycle has KPIs that are different between one model and the other. And if we don't align on that, uh, I will come here and I will tell you a number. Marco will come with another, Anthony with another one, and Carla with another one. And not because we're wrong or we're true, but because there is a self-interpretation. I mean, we have already that with, our, uh, with another French company that is in the stock market, and we don't do the same interpretation of the, of the life cycle assessment after the boat is out of the wall of the company. So you see that these are parameters that can really impact, uh, and I think that there is a level of transparency that it needs to come as a coordination, as Anthony was saying, uh, very precisely. Otherwise, we can always be shamed as being uh, the guys that are cheating on that, or we are not uh, sufficiently structured to make it happen. Yeah, agreed. Hello. I would ask uh, IBI and all the association to help us to, to, to be involved uh, in the regulation, because being so small, less than 1%, uh, 0.01% in the all shipping maritime regulation. We just are treated like uh, Merckx and the shipping line. That's the big problem. That this is the a big problem. Risk. And we have already suffered a lot, the, the so-called inox uh, filters or the SGR filter. Yeah. The, at the end, of course, we have been obliged, because this is the rules on, uh, in this moment, we have been obliged to put the filter in our size of boat. The, the, the weight we added caused a higher uh, pollution in CO2 yeah. to take out some neutral oxide. It's simply crazy. So we need to be helped to be considered a true industry not just uh, someone uh, selling a uh, few boats uh, to ultra rich. Also there we need your help. The press, when uh, saying, when uh, writing about a big yacht that has been delivered, they point out that he is a ultra millionaire uh, from Hong Kong, from Mexico. No one talk about the thousand people that are employed to, to build that yacht. So we need the press, the association to, okay, from one side it's true, we are small, but we are different. So we need to be treated in a different way. And this is, a, especially the European one, the, 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 an industry that produces wonderful pieces and there's a thousand and thousand and thousand employees. This is important. No, I 100% agree. I think, I think the way we are categorized at the moment is wrong. And it has been for a long, long time. Unfortunately, we are in a maritime category that doesn't fit the assets we're creating. So therefore, it's a confusing landscape yeah. that we now need to say, we're not a ship. We're no longer in the category as Maersk or something else, because the, the revenues are different, the operational profile is different, and the customer is different. So we have to get Brussels or the policymakers and people like Philip to say, the yachting is its own industry Absolutely. and it has to have its own, let's say, assessment and also policy. It's been something that's been discussed for a long, long time. I know Max is very strong on this, yes. <laughs> but it, it, has to, it has to start happening. Still, Otherwise, we can't adapt absolutely. to what the future requires. I just don't, Felix will talk about this later on, but it's like, these are the things I feel that all the CEOs in yachting, and not just the big boys, but every CEO in the supply chain, the, the primary supply chain, and the manufacturers, the infrastructure, and maybe yeah. engine companies should meet and discuss this, because it probably never happens. No. And I feel that's one of the opportunities that Blue Innovation and Boot or whatever can come together and start yeah. saying, treat us fairly and treat us in the way we need to be treated to make us allow us that change or that transition. Because regulation will come again and keep coming, especially on the infrastructure side, to change how yachts are operated in key locations. It's, it's a fear of mine that in 10 years' time, we can't operate in our favorite hotspots. So anyway, Anthony, what do you want from the policymakers? Yeah, I'm glad to have this opportunity. Um, I think that there's a, a couple of things. Um, in the UK, we've had certain instances of some rhetoric around 
Uh, every boat that comes out by 2025 needs to have a full electric variant, um, which, apart from the fact that it's not technically possible to do, highlights um, a, a reaction to try to solve the problem by prescribing technologies on one or two new boats, rather than addressing what should be the issue of, of hundreds of thousands of yachts floating in the, in, around, around the world, and how do we actually reduce the CO2 that goes into the environment, which is what we're worried about. Yeah. Not, so we would much rather take, as I said before, 1% off of every boat we've ever made than say, hey, we've got one electric yacht, which we've sold to one customer who keeps it on, on, on Lake Geneva. Um, so in order to do that, the focus needs very much to be around how do we actually reduce the CO2 that goes in the environment in a much more holistic uh, manner. One of the advantages we have as yacht companies, because we are small, compared to commercial ships, where the customers are, are, it's business to business, we have people who demand innovation and whims. And there's a lot of bubbliness and new ideas. We're constantly launching new models. And so we have the ability to introduce things onto market very quickly. Uh, reference the two multi-hulls that uh, my esteemed colleagues here have launched. I'm jealous, great boats. Um, and the, the opportunities, I think we can have seen that these companies, us, we can do our thing from the side where we can make an influence, but not obviously on the powertrain side. So we need to be able to be used for the things that we can do, but we also need some direction from government about where the bigger picture is gonna come from. If it is alternative fuels, what are the alternative fuels? What's the infrastructure? When can it be so we can develop the boats that will fit that? At the moment, I think we're all flying a bit blind. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Marco, any comment? <laughs> any comment for what I already said? Uh, to set on point, it's true. We are yachting is a big uh, industry, but within the maritime, uh, say, um, umbrella, and the main issue is that sometimes uh, all the uh, rules are just a consequence of some but yes, based on bigger business, larger business. And we have to, we have to adapt ourselves, uh, try to uh, combine what is the market demand, to a certain point, client that is uh, focusing on some other, let's say, trends, and what are the regulations that are imposed to. So uh, the, the field, as just Carla mentioned, as a matter of fact, is true. So we adopt ourselves and we say, okay, standard. But standard that from one day to the other, we have to adapt uh, our products and try to explain to the market that this is something that is needed. So um, we are flexible to a certain point, and the good point that there are small uh, co companies to be flexible enough to adapt ourselves to the needs that is requested. But at a certain point, we need uh, some helps from uh, <laughs> from the governments, <laughs> try to say we have a dini a dignity. <laughs> try to. But, but the, the question, the, the question I have that, that comes to my mind now is, have you all ever met with government to discuss the future <laughs> on a regular basis? In, in the UK, yes. In the UK, yes. Yeah. But like, yeah, like, Italy, yes. That, that's that's the point. We are still, we are not Europe, we are still the association of federal units that talk on themselves. I was, I invited Fabio Planamente, who I think is one of uh, the guy of yeah. the uh, Italian Federation in Paris, to start talking about how can we sit together and uh, see what you're doing on your side, what you're doing on our side, and come up with a, with a common proposal. Because if we don't uh, come up with common proposal, this project will... Uh, last uh, 20 years, yeah. and then the, the rules will come and the rules will be not be adapted, so we will have all be, uh, be imposed something, as was Marco was saying, that we don't want. So, th so the real problem is, again, bottom up and top down. Now that we have an association of uh, uh, quite large players that understand the impact and the importance of that, because the other problem that we don't have to underestimate, I mean, it's not represented in this panel, but this year, a few areas of southern France were banned by uh, water jets, were banned by some types of products for the pollution, for the noise, for that. So th the last thing that we want uh, is that uh, we don't let our customers uh, live their dream and exploring uh, what they want. Okay? So it's something that we have to take seriously into account because if the restrictions are coming and they're coming locally, then we are screwed. 
because it's not me, it's not uh, Saint Laurent, it's not uh, me, me as a group Benetton, huh? uh, uh, it's not Princess Asimov or the other, it's really a restriction that it's, uh, it goes beyond ourselves because we're not united into trying to, A, as we said before, make sure that we are not the B2B industry of the marine business of Merckx and the other, we are something apart that we talk to our customers in a completely different way, and we want to make sure that they live their dream on the water altogether. And so how we adapt, and I think it's an incredible opportunity also for the years to come uh, to better structure this business and to be less uh, the uh, garagist, as they call uh, some of them, and to be a bit more uh, associated with the integrators uh, of the technology and so forth. Yeah. I would add that uh, it's very important, one more, that uh, the perception of the industry change. Because the government, they don't care at all about us, because they have uh, problems that are of enormous, uh, another order of uh, magnitude. But I remember I have been uh, president of the Italian Association, and uh, we discussed it with the government. Uh, we didn't get any answer, but this is worst during the longest and deepest uh, crisis we ever experienced in 2012, the Italian government, do you remember, they did a law to get money from the, from the not from the, uh, the owner, for all the boat touching the Italian port. I have here the responsible of the, in the, our association of the marinas, was simply a strategy because Italy is a small uh, part of land and all water around and was a very, very heavy tax. All the Italian, the foreign boat didn't come anymore, but all the Italian, they went to Croatia, to Spain, etc. We prepare a, 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 a file like this for the government, they not even answer. And we prove that lost for getting some million in tax, they, they lost, we lost, uh, also oh, uh, 40,000 votes left because he was in charge of this file. We left Italy. You can imagine we have just marine around us. So the government must change the approach also to, to the sector because it's not just a rich mark. Yes, our clients are rich, the company are not bad. They, but there is, a, again, a different perception that has to be changed. I think this is very important. Please help us to do this. You feel involved, me, Philip? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, I think what's interesting there, Carla, is that, is that yes, perception's a problem. And we've just had a, a two-week in Davos. Yeah. And obviously, again, that was a very key focus on the wealth divide. Wealth inequality yeah. was a big topic of conversation. So it's not going to go away. It won't go away. What we have to change is our internal communication of what we do, how we do it, and, and what the output is. Because no one makes money out of yachting. <laughs> As a, I want to, yeah, yeah. The, the, the investor in the actual asset doesn't make money, necessarily. So the, the, the whole process of ab adopting change of perception has to start because otherwise the next generation will change their attitude as well. Absolutely. Which becomes another 15 minute chat about how do we bring the new client, the potential client, and the next generation into our industry. Not just with yacht ownership, but also employment and future workforce. Because how many of you struggle at the moment to find new people at a starting point? You are right. Who wants to go? I mean, I had employees, I was discussing yesterday with Bruno. Uh, we had employees that decided this year to come to Dusseldorf by bus. Yep. We had employees that decided to go to Cambodia by train. Okay, so the cultural shift, uh, it's not happening the next 10 years. It's already inside our companies. Yep. Whether we like it or not, they are much more... Uh, uh, willing to understand how fast we're going to integrate the shift uh, rather than anybody else inside of the company. And our first and most important uh, 
uh, effort is to really make sure that our, in our case, our uh, 9,000 employees, uh, they all feel uh, that they share the values of the group. So you understand that yesterday when they, we took our uh, plane in Nantes to come to uh, Amsterdam and so forth, we were thinking about, uh, okay, we now pay the tax for the CO2 emission to the tickets that we buy, but already our employees, uh, they want to take the bus because they already are a step ahead of us. Yeah. So if you think that the next generation, so my daughter, that every time she comes to the beach because she was trained at school to clean the beach, she takes the parts of plastic away, there will be, we are not ready for that yet, yeah. I think, because the, 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 that uh, entire wave of post-COVID created an awareness that was not uh, anticipated yeah, enough. Yeah, so we have this incredible acceleration and we have to make sure that, uh, as I said before, we have to join forces bottom-up and top-down uh, between politics and industries. Uh, the federation are there to federate, so to really try to be the accelerator and not the democratization of each and every one. And uh, I think that at the end of the day, the reality is that there will be also a selection or natural selection of this uh, new challenge that will cut off uh, some of uh, uh, the non-structured approach that we still have in our industry. Because it's still, let's say, let's be honest, uh, it's still a very low, uh, uh, it's, it's quite easy to access to this business uh, if you want to just try to build one boat and uh, not care about uh, pollution, environment, uh, rules, uh, safety, and uh, regulations. Yeah, and this no is no, a no big barriers gap, to eh? entry. No barriers no. to entry. No, no. But no. you are right, Martin. From one side, we, we see that, uh, and the economists say that uh, the luxury sector will grow at a very high path for pace for, uh, for many years. On the other side, we have to attract the new buyer. New buyer means with new mentality. So uh, what I think we have to immediately, as soon as we can, of course, we discussed it before, to give a serious answer to their uh, sustainability query. And uh, because, uh, uh, do you remember, many years ago, uh, was, you see also young people, young ladies, with uh, wearing uh, fur coats. Today, no one will consider, and this has been a a tragedy for uh, a tragedy, oh tragedy, tragedy, <laughs> tragedy for uh, for the sector of the first because has really collapsed. <coughs> so things happen uh, quite uh, uh, fast, and uh, the new buyer will be will be very rich, richer, but not interested because we don't give the right answer. Yeah, Anthony, you said that you had a a new boat that was only really interested for one person. I think you had a lack of appetite for the electric projects you were delivering. Is that right? Yeah, well, it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's great for headlines, but it doesn't actually do anything for the environment. The technology is expensive yeah. to do it properly. Uh, we, the um, lady before on the screen talked about safety, um, spending a considerable amount of my extracurricular time being on boards of electric car companies, the cost to do it properly is way out of the scope of what most boat companies can do. And so it's, it becomes, a, for the volumes that we, that we produce, a very difficult economic equation unless there is a single solution that everybody ad adopts and it's not a differentiating factor. So we're, we're trying to look at, think out of the box um, at what we can do with the things I mentioned, different boat concepts, all focusing on how do you require less energy to go, through, to go through the water. Um, I do think we need to, to pick up on the point that Carla mentioned, is that we still need to start to think about new generation of, of buyers. Um, we have lots of buyers who are um, at a certain point in their life, um, and their reaction to sustainability is, do you think I can't afford the, afford the fuel? Well, they're still our customers, and we want to appeal to them, yep. and have their boats uh, consume less fuel, but there are gonna be others who are gonna question whether they wanna go like this with the throttle or maybe they should pull back and go a little bit slower. And what does that mean for us? To be honest, just as the shipping industry has done, we could all save a lot of CO2 by going like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's every little increment of change, as you said earlier on, will dial down the impact. And that's the existing fleet and the new fleet. 1%, or even one or two degrees on the air conditioning 
changes the game. All yep. these things are almost mind shifts. We have to, and I was saying this the other day to another shipyard, it's like, we have to start, stop, stop promoting maximum speed. We all still produce in the press releases here, maximum speed. We have to change the, di the, the dialogue and say optimum or most efficient or exactly. start talking a new language because air conditioning is a massive consumer. The generator is a massive consumer, a, a hotel load. All these things with one or 2% or degree or whatever decrease, I'll go back to your point, 1% dec decline in CO2 emission across the whole fleet is far greater than a new build impact. We, we also need to be careful not to fall into the same trap that the auto industry is falling into. Uh, the innovation in electrification is fantastic. The speed of adoption is fantastic. But in the same way that, turbo, that direct injection common rail turbo diesels replaced petrol engines, and then some very sophisticated turbo petrol engines replaced common rail diesels, when the savings came, people decided to decline it in more power, more this, more that. So we have now electric cars which are much larger, much heavier, much quicker, uh, and using up huge amounts of limited natural resources to have battery packs that allow you to go 600 kilometers when you'll use that maybe once a year and are carrying the weight around. Yep. And we just have to make sure that when we do this, we do this in a logical way that actually helps the environment rather than af offering even more of a luxury and waste to a customer. Well, it all becomes a smart approach. Right, the, smart, the word smart is something we have to really adopt as an industry because you're right, reducing weight and having a better hull form and then dialing down on a degree or two on energy or power consumption, that makes big inroads into the whole process. Yeah. And this, is, this is a point, the fact that uh, <clears throat> it's not a question only of, uh, let's say, electrifying the propulsion, but it's the fact that uh, you, you need a way to reduce the weight or to try to reduce the consumption in any case. You made a, a good example, air conditioning. Design push windows larger, air conditioning has been pushed up. Yep. So the, the point is when you try to get now some uh, uh, windows that can protect from uh, the rays, you just uh, drop this kind of consumption with the use of the, uh, consciously of the of their conditioning. And this is what we are working, what we should work, in, even to define it a bit what the design is functional for the, for the low emission. It's not only the fact that we're waiting for somebody to say, okay, now you have the right propulsion, you are, now you have the right uh, fuels, that you have the right consumption way. You, we have to work as a as a team to a certain point, but at the same time, as a, uh, the, the, the market is pushing us in that direction. You, talk, you, you spoke about the new generation. This is even it's simpler because the, it's already done. The new, the, new, the new generation is thinking already in this way. I'm a 54, and I see that uh, my, my son, 22, yeah, is a different, a new, different to, to, to approach to things. Uh, even the new employees that, we are, that are coming to our company, they have a different way to think, so we have to change our mind, they are not uh, engaged because of the money or the careers, they engage of the project. They like the project. If you sell the dreams of the project, they follow you. And they are actually focused on that, more than what we believe. Yeah. Yeah. And to the extreme, uh, they are not interested about the ownership, but they're interested uh, about the use. <laughs> So the time that they can exploit something. So the entire economical business model could be uh, modified in the years to come. Well, I, I think that's a, a good thing to finish on because I think that's a very important topic. The capex, opex slash use of a yacht may shift quite dramatically in the on-demand thinking of yachting being not just an ownership route but a occupancy, usage, sharing economy. How many clients come to you about in that mindset of saying, we don't want to buy outright, we want to just use and share and buy with two friends or have a different way of owning? Is well, that coming now or is uh, it? Yeah. At least on us, uh, a lot more yeah, than yeah. we expected. And you, yeah. uh, we have the charter parts. Yes. So as you know, we, we, we are uh, co-shareholders of 
two of the biggest charter companies in, uh, for sailboats in the market uh, with different destinations. So in there, you really buy your week and not uh, a boat. Uh, we have also a boat club, which is, let's say, the, daily, the pure daily use. So you don't own anymore a boat, but you have a pool of boats that you can use. Uh, you go to your app, uh, today you're free for four hours, you take it and you, you use it as much as you want. Uh, and then there is a completely in incredible transformation, at least we see on the, on the more on the multi-hull sides, uh, sail and power, both of them, where there is fractional ownership that is coming together. Uh, even if you have uh, ultra-high wealth people, they have a li limited amount of time that they can spend on their boats yeah. and, uh, and that they can enjoy. So what they do is that they try to raise the standard of what they fit into their boats uh, and uh, they share the cost with uh, two uh, other families that they know very well, that they know that they can uh, respect uh, mutually uh, something, and it becomes a, a completely different ap approach, uh, and they already start to scale up. And it's not just in Europe, but it's also in the uh, US. Yeah. So we see that trend uh, growing, again, bottom up. So we didn't create uh, that alternative, but it became by pool of people that organized themselves to do that. So the, the, the shift, it's <coughs> again, it's happening. Uh, and the speed at which uh, it goes uh, might vary because if you sell one boat to four, it's n you're not selling four boats to <laughs> anymore. So that has an impact as well. Yeah, sure. sure. We, we have, cre yes, the answer is yes. We thought already and uh, still thinking. We have created one year ago a new division in San Lorenzo called the high-end services, thinking also to the new buyer, the mentality of the new buyer, they are less for the, to possess the yacht, but to experience the yacht. And so we have created these high-end services. Uh, and uh, one, three weeks ago, we started operationally the new company we have bought. We have acquired a, a charter, a very famous and uh, reputed charter company, because we want to develop that. It is a dedicated new division. Yeah, I mean, uh, having started my career in the auto industry, we always looked at the yachting industry and saying they're doing a lot more on, on you know, all these charter companies. So actually, to me, the boating industry actually started this more than, more than, more than any other private use uh, in industry. Um, and it is, we see two very distinct groups. There are those people who buy, who want to do this because it works and they can do fractional ownership. And there are those people who don't want anybody sleeping in their bed, to put it bluntly. And their boat is their safe haven. Unless by invitation. Pardon me? Unless by invitation. Unless by invitation <laughs> only, yes. <laughs> and um, and it's, you know, it's the same attitude between people who would, would never do Airbnb for their own house and people who do it all the time because they can make some money and they, yeah. can, ha they can afford something a bit bigger. So it's two very distinct market groups. That's true. Uh, again, there is this trend. It's not really coming from just uh, this year. There are many years that uh, the trends that people that don't want to use uh, their own boats but try to get the experience. And many of them become uh, uh, owner at the end, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that is uh, becoming wider the database, let's say this, of the clientele. Of course, with the COVID, the push uh, the chart uh, up uh, over the last year, and uh, the trends that uh, would be higher and higher. Uh, this would be what the, the um, statistics says. And uh, I think that uh, we are, uh, as, a, as a company, is developing uh, strategies how to acquire a new clientele, also to provide this kind of services through, uh, let's say, your own uh, uh, fleet, owned by fin final owners so that can give, uh, they can give uh, the, uh, their own boats at disposal for somebody else uh, through a kind of agreements. Uh, this, is, this is a strategy. The other one is, of course, the, the, the normal standard charter process. OK, we we're nearly at uh, time up, but I'm going to ask you all to say one thing. You can't repeat to each other or duplicate what you say, but like, if there's one thing we have to focus on for the next five years to change our marketplace, what would it be? And you, you can you go start first. from there now. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever, whoever's ready, go first. Start, start, from, start from there. I, s I think lady first. <laughs> They're saying ladies first, Carla. Change, if you could change one thing about our industry, what would it be? Into the industry? Yeah. 
the mentality and the approach when considering uh, uh, the wool sector. So I think that we are missing, and in some way these uh, debates uh, prove this, we are missing the possibility to join uh, forces Still in, too, a true, too fragmented. in a true, not bluff path. Agreed. I, I said before, I think that if we can achieve uh, uh, a life cycle assessment KPI that can be shared and agreed uh, in the next five years between the builders, that would be already an incredible achievement in order to really understand all the effort that we do yes. to comply with rules, uh, with safety and regulations, uh, yeah. and that it's not always uh, <laughs> uh, marketable. Market. Yes. Anthony? Um, probably to shift from talking about things to doing things. 100%. And Marco, finally. I agree on the fact to have uh, some common ground on the K K KPI. As I said at the beginning of this panel, try to create an index that can uh, at least uh, give the same ideas of uh, uh, consumption uh, rate. So if we have something like it's uh, common and automotive, at least you have uh, targets. Uh, based on that, uh, the technology improved themselves. Uh, so our, our each company is trying to improve themselves. Otherwise, we are talking about uh, Dreams or smokes or uh, fakes. Yeah. Okay. Panel, you've been amazing. Thank you very much. We could do, talk for thank hours, you. but thank you. you. And, uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>